Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nordic Sound channel. Uh, I am your host, Jameson Foster, and today we are very lucky and fortunate to have none other than Alakar with us uh, from Dreamer Circus, who we talked about last week on the Nordic Sound today. Um, he is here to talk to us about the band, their newest single, Brestis Kvaya, uh, and the upcoming album, Lost Swans, out on April 8th. Uh, a little bit about Ala. Um, he is the sit-turn player, among many other instruments for Dreamer's Circus. Um, and he's also an educator at the Malmo Academy of Music. And uh, if I read correctly, as of 2017, are you the world champion clog fiddle player? <laughs> it's, it actually is the truth, yes. And I, 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 um, I lost the title the year after. But oh, no. <laughs> I, I reclaimed it last year, so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was a title you had to reclaim. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it goes on every year. All right, cool. Yeah. So um, I would love to get more into that, but uh, to, to, keep this, to keep this rolling, um, before we talk about the newest single in the upcoming album, uh, I would love to know, as a contemporary folk band, um, would you like to tell us more about the tradition that you all grew up with or the tradition you work in? Um, essentially, where does the music that you guys work with come from? Yeah, great. So, um, well, we uh, we all grew up in uh, the, the Scandinavian music uh, tradition, right? So my two uh, band members are from Denmark. I'm from Sweden. Uh, so outnumbered. Outnumbered. <laughs> but uh, I'm from I'm from the southern part of Sweden mm -hmm. uh, called Skåne, and it's very uh, similar to. Uh, Denmark mm -hmm. in uh, in in many ways. So Sweden is a is a very tall country, right? So yep. um, it's uh, it's actually pretty different, at least from a a traditional music perspective. Mm -hmm. It changes a lot as it goes up. So my part is very closely connected to Denmark, and cool. uh, the music I grew up with uh, is um, well traditional music. So both my parents are playing traditional music from the area, local music, uh, which is um, a part of a living tradition. It's uh, orally transmitted. You learn tunes from uh, peers and uh, elders, and you meet up and share these tunes, and uh, you use them, right? So mm -hmm. in our it's case- It's very much a social experience, right? Absolutely. So I've been very fortunate to to be a part of that uh, that social context. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, many others have been introduced to it later, but for me, I grew up in it. Uh, very and cool. uh, the primary, the the most of the music is dance based, right? So it's mm -hmm. based on folk dances. Uh, so you would say like, now we're gonna play a. Scottish, for example, or a mm -hmm. waltz, or a kind of a polska, or or whatever, and uh, and typically the tunes they don't have names, so you just say mm -hmm. now we're gonna play a waltz from this guy who is typically right. some dude uh, who lived a hundred years ago, and what you say then is you say this is his version of this tune that we don't know who composed it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it could, that's why a lot of it's why a lot of uh, Swedish tunes uh, will be like uh, Polska Efter, uh, then someone's name. Um, and then in Norwegian, it would be Etter, someone's name. Um, exactly. It's always fun going through a whole album and just seeing yeah, yeah. blank Etter blank or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Because you don't know who wrote the tune, right? And, uh, right. and, and typically, you can also find uh, very similar versions of the same tune, mm -hmm. but they're like after different people. And that's, that's very fun when you find them across borders as well. Oh, this is a Finnish yep. tune, you know, uh, because we found it in the 1700s in this Finnish tune book, you know, by mm -hmm. this guy who wrote down tunes. But then yeah. they all have it in Sweden, uh, which is right. slightly <laughs> different, but it's the same tune, you know. Right. So, so taking this oral tradition and writing it down was like a very 19th century thing to do, right? And, you know, there's a lot of you know, there are a lot of, you know, benefits and problems that come with writing down an oral tradition. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, do you know like, who the primary actors were with collecting those tunes in Sweden? Um, because we do talk on the podcast in Norway, it was very much um, a guy named uh, Matthias Ludvig, uh, Ludvig Matthias Lindemann um, and uh, Langstad, Alea Kroger, people like that. Um, does Sweden have a similar like cast of characters who are traveling around collecting these melodies? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so we we have a we have a a collector 
uh, or, or rather, you can say one of the most famous people uh, behind the movement in Sweden is Anders Son, who okay. is a painter, uh, a very well-known painter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He actually, I think he was pretty famous in the States, actually. Uh, if I recall his story correctly, he traveled to the States and uh, made paintings and sold them and became rich and famous, you know, the classic <laughs> okay. story. Uh, and um, he then went back to Sweden. I think he spent like 20 years over there or something like that. Um, and when he came back, he noticed a big difference uh, in the music that he grew up with. So it had, it had disappeared and he, he was uh, afraid that he was going to, uh, you know, disappear completely and people were going to stop playing it because people were playing new, other music, you know, they didn't care too much about about uh, you know I, cultural identity and and that whole thing you know but mm -hmm. at that time it was pretty fashionable to be uh, you know nationalistic or like national romanticism and all that stuff you know as you can see in the symphonic music etc yeah very uh, much so yeah so this was the same here so they were like oh no we need to be swedish and uh, and stuff so um so they he paid uh, many of the uh, initiatives that came about. So, uh, for example, the thing called a, uh, you can become a rikspelman, which is a mm -hmm. sort of a national folk musician uh, status. Like you get an actual medal where it says <laughs> like you are a rikspelman, which means more or less you're you're you know your stuff and you're great at playing. And mm -hmm. it's called a son uh, um, medal after this dude because he uh, initiated it and paid for uh, the thing and then there's a couple of collectors traveling around uh, primarily actually uh, people like Nils Andersson and mm -hmm. Olof Andersson two people uh, from uh, I think the other brothers I guess from uh, from Skåne my part uh, <laughs> Go team. They, yeah exactly and they travel all, all around Sweden and they recorded uh, thousands of tunes uh, very, very cool written down with biographies and pictures and of these different people that they uh, collected from. Awesome. so and just a, one short note about that also mm -hmm. is that there was a conscious choice about what tunes they wanted to record right because the whole narrative was we need to preserve something that being lost so therefore they tried to preserve what they feel is worth preserving so there's a Absolutely. very pretty you know a distinct filter going on there so they have actively chosen older material uh they've chosen lots of what we call polskas which is popular and less of, less of the polkas and and and, and similar uh, more modern uh, at the time uh, music and and also like accordion music uh, which was becoming more and more popular, which is one of the one of the threats to the older music. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's not necessarily representative to the music people would play at the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, those are two two big misconceptions um, that I find with folk music. Um, as a as a musicologist, as an ethnomusicologist, we talk about this all the time. Where um, the people who collected these melodies. Uh, had an agenda, right? Not to make it sound sinister, uh, but they were collecting it for a reason. Um, and, you know, from, from Scotland to Norway to Sweden, the people collecting the music wanted to find a music that sounded different in a very specific way. So you have the person filtering out, like a lot of people who collected Norwegian tunes, um, they would specifically look for ones that were in the Lydian mode because they sounded different. Um, and they would, yeah, there was a whole bunch of filtering going on, like only collecting the music that sounded Swedish or what Swedish should sound like. Um, exactly. Yeah. And then also the other misconception is that this music is ancient as we know it, that the music we, as we know it today is ancient when in reality, a lot of the melodies were really only from, you know, like 200 years ago, of course they could yeah. be older, but as we know them, um, you know, absolutely about 19th and century. And also we don't know what they sounded like back then, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. uh, a lot of the a lot of the a lot, a lot of the traditions were cut off at some point and then and then sort of resurrected or recreated mm -hmm. based on sheet music you know but yeah that's sort of similar to reading an old uh, shakespeare text you know right. <laughs> because you have no idea what it sounded like you know you can sort yeah. of guess but 
<laughs> it's the best the you can bird do. Sucks. Yeah. And then, um, so what about the, the big folk revival movement in like the late, in the late 20th century? Cause I know, um, you know, there's a big thing over here in the States where, you know, Bob Dylan, everyone was all right. super high off of, off of folk music. Um, how did that play out, you know, over in, over in Scandinavia? Well, in similar ways, obviously, we also had sort of the hippie movement uh, mm -hmm. as well, uh, and lots of singer songwriters and, and stuff like that. Um, I think our our, uh, our our singer songwriting was actually deeply connected to the folk songs, like Swedish folk songs and, mm -hmm. and Nordic folk songs. Um, but if, if we talk about uh, uh, our or, or my uh, part of the tradition, which is primarily the dance music, Mm -hmm. uh, I think a big difference was that uh, it was there was a big professionalization of the music. So you were right. talking on concerts uh, rather than exclusively dancing, uh, you know, so people would sit down and listen to the music, uh, which was strange for many people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or exciting as well. Uh, you could uh, like the, the, the first uh, college education in folk music opened in 79. Uh, okay. It wasn't possible to study on a college level before because mm -hmm. it wasn't academic music. It wasn't professional music. You know, you were supposed to visit some old dude in a cabin and learn the tune. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, how I learned now, Swedish. Exactly. <laughs> I went and visited some older some older woman up in a cabin at the top of a mountain in New Hampshire. It was just her alone with a pack of Labradors. Uh, right. that, that was my pilgrimage <laughs> I made every week. <laughs> that's, how you, that's how you're supposed to do it, right? right. <laughs> you, don't, you don't use Duolingo or whatever it's called. <laughs> uh, but, oh, you know, so there was, the bands were created, uh, some artists were, were starting to get some, you know, gather some fame, uh, being seen in television, in radio. Uh, people were introducing new instruments to the genre. People were experimenting with the jazz and classical music mm -hmm. and pop music. And, you know, Ab ABBA is in many ways <laughs> folk pop. Uh, yep. I knew ABBA and, was going to have to come up. <laughs> there you go. So uh, um, you, you bring up a really interesting transition that happened with with folk music. Where, um, we started off talking about is like this this social experience very rooted in, in dance. Um, and when the folk revival came around you know it gets wrapped up with you know the recording industry and, and the and the concert industry and that is when this big shift happens where this music goes from being something you dance to to being something you listen to um and of course that affects the music being made quite a bit um and also standardizes it in a way because once someone records it it's now theirs like that's one of the the you know more troubling parts of the whole thing so but this transition from dance like music as an activity to like something you listen to um how does that play into you know making folk music today yeah it's 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 really changed it a lot you know uh, because uh, originally it's much about the, the sort of connection and and improvisation and and uh, and trance and all sorts of stuff that you don't really get in a cd format you know right <laughs> uh, or or even a concert setting so in many ways, it's um, it's been changed forever. Uh, there is still a very living sort of a, a real authentic environment. There are mm -hmm. still many places you can just go and experience these dance evenings, singing evenings, jam sessions, all of this. You know, we but... have one of those here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, yeah, I, I actually played. I play this big dumb instrument with them. Um, there, there's a whole. Um, a whole coalition of of Swedish immigrants here who uh, who play yeah, yeah. Uh, traditional tunes, and I just started playing with them recently because uh, they have never had a bassist before. Um, so we play like you know gamble dance uh, when we when we okay. go into like the Norwegian side, but then we also you know play a lot of poles, shatishas, uh, uh, awesome. hambos, uh, yeah, and every they, that's every week. You know, I'm the youngest person there by about thirty years hey, every hey, week. Hey, hey. Uh, however, oh, um, it's still very much that is an example of what you're talking about. There's still ways to go experience it um, in the activity way rather than the sit down, put on so a CD and listen sort of way. I think I think one the, the one of the major differences is that uh, you know you realize it when you go through older tunes, like if you find a sheet music book. And you mm -hmm. sort of try to find some good tunes in there. Uh, I think my experience is that a lot of the time you don't really see the appeal 
in many of the tunes. Mm-hmm. And you sort of uh, try to play it out. It's okay, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's fine. And then the next tune, and then like 10 tunes in, you're like, okay, that's I can use that one, you know? <laughs> and I think that's partly because you've sort of taken it out of its context. Absolutely. Uh, I, we, I did a project recently where this guy in, in Roskilde in Denmark, he had found uh, several, I don't even remember how many, but several hundreds of tunes, which was forgotten. Uh, and he compiled the best in a, in a book. And we uh, were going to be part of the release of this book and play for dancing as well, which we typically never do uh, with, with my band. Uh, mm-hmm. We're more of a concert band. Right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but only then when we played the tunes for dancing with the dances that they were supposed to uh, be a part of was when we appreciated several of these tunes. Mm-hmm. Then it's when we it like dawned on us like okay this is actually a good tune. Before we discarded it as a bad tune, but when it was in its right in its right elements, right context, it made sense. Yeah, that that happens a lot you know, with a lot of genres, even with classical music. Like you know, yeah. how many people have heard Beethoven's Fifth, but how many person, how many people have heard that thing in person, right? Like it's an entirely different experience. Um, that's something that's easy to forget, like when we're when we consume, you know, not to be an old man about it, because I do it all the time when we were consuming music, you know, online uh, and, and yeah. you know, ver- digitally all the time. It's very it's very easy to forget, like that experiential aspect of the music as well. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so Dreamer's Circus is a pretty evocative name. Um, could you tell us more about the name and how it relates to the band's vision and style, considering everything we just talked about uh, regarding like the path of folk music from 200 years ago up to today? Right. So I, I, I'm, um, I grew up in this super traditional, hardcore traditional environment, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I was a teenager, I started um, feeling a need to expand that music. Uh, I listened to, to uh, you know, like most mus- muso kids, I listened to all sorts of super extrovert music, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, Toto and all that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> cool. Uh, and, um, and many other things as well. So I, I, I felt a need to sort of uh, go uh, above this sort of, pretty basic layer to me for example in harmony wise it's mostly like two or three chords mm-hmm. in every song right yep. uh, and, reliable. And, and, yeah exactly you know <laughs> and that's you know pros pros and cons to that but, <laughs> but but then also when you talk about form for example it's like a b a b a b and we're good you know that's yep. your t- <laughs> Uh, for example, and, and the list goes on, and I felt like wanting to move, uh, try something different and challenge the music. So I was obsessed with the idea of making modern folk music, uh, contemporary folk music. So I started writing my own tunes, and uh, I, I found these guys, uh, Rune and Nikolai from Denmark, uh, and mm-hmm. we shared this, uh, this ambition. Uh, and uh, that was our starting point. And that sort of escalated into uh, our music today, where we don't really feel, uh, we, we realize that it's, um, we're being held back by that idea of mm-hmm. making contemporary folk music. And now it's more like we just make uh, music uh, that we like, but, is, uh, but we realize that our roots are in this tradition and we love that music and in, in a way we feel a responsibility to to uh, be a part of that of that movement but we do it in our way which is to try to push the boundaries of what that music nordic music nordic folk music uh, can include uh, mm-hmm. and what it can uh, what is relatable uh, like when does it become something else than Nordic folk music, you know? So our band name sort of reflects that uh, idea. So it's a, if you think about um, dreamers, what does that mean? For example, it mm-hmm. could be ambition, it could be vision, uh, impact, it could be all sorts of these abstract meanings, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
uh, and circus uh, means like acrobatics, acrobatics, magic, uh, playfulness, all of those kind of things, virtuosity perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then it's the combination of these two things that we feel is it explains what we want to do with music. Yeah, it's so cool because I still remember the first time I ever. I don't know if it was your first your first album album, but I remember I listened to one of your at least one of your earliest albums, uh, Little Symphony. Little Symphony. Mm -hmm. um, first album album. Yeah. I I listened to that front to back, and I was just like, "This is a circus," but like in a great <laughs> way. It's like I don't know what's happening next. And exactly. It opens exactly. up, doesn't it? Open up with you playing the clog fiddle. That's our next album. Yeah, second oh, movement. Uh, oh, second movement. That's the album yeah. that has room in Paris on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's actually the song I discovered you guys with. I remember I was right. I was walking home from work one day, and that song came on shuffle, and I stopped on my yeah. walk home, and I was like what is this this is incredible so yeah i mean yeah. like i feel like that name absolutely it communicates so many different things but all of those things also describe you like that's yeah. a pretty interesting thing when you have a name that has all of these different meanings and associations but they all fit you it's sort of like the experience of listening to one of your albums you know i talked about um it's i feel like it was especially true with the with your most recent album um blue white gold it was like every song was like or every piece was like a different kind of a different style but still sounded like you yeah. um like you guys did that um like sort of neo-primitive sounding uh you know where i think runa was playing the drum um oh, and yeah. and it made me feel like i was listening to like a varjuna album i was like what what is this this is yeah. right after uh while the world was waiting or something like that and i was like these guys are going all over the place yeah. but it still sounds like dreamer circus um and that's a really hard thing to accomplish as a band yeah, that's what we go for live, honestly. Uh, we Normally when people ask what we sound like, uh, I try to tell them not to listen to a track yeah. <laughs> on Spotify <laughs> or whatever. Because if you listen to one track, you go like, okay, it's this kind of band. You know, they play this mm -hmm. kind of music. And then they listen to the next track and they sort of, hang on, what's going on here? You know? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> because, yeah. Because we're moving on, like some of our music sounds like chamber music, you know? Some <laughs> is like cinematic, uh, symphonic music, and some is, you know, pop music, and some is uh, hardcore trad music. And it's it's really <laughs> all sorts of stuff. So, um, and we, we like to keep it that way. And we're I'm really happy cool. that you, uh, you still feel that there's a sort of a, a connection. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It even comes out like you're, your moon sessions am i pronouncing that correctly moon yeah, moon sessions. um that i remember watching that front to back um and even like when you guys are doing a live performance without uh the without the wiggle room that a that a recorded you know performance yeah, yeah. gives like it's just you guys like out in a field making music and even without any studio magic it all sounds coherent uh and that you know that's quite the experience um, yeah, I even, I played, uh, for my students before class every week, I like to play a different Nordic, uh, band for them. I teach Norse mythology to undergrads awesome. here. Um, and I showed you guys, I showed them your moon sessions, um, of mm -hmm. while the world was waiting and they loved it. Uh, Crazy. super into it. Yeah. Um, anyway, I could talk about this for hours, but we should probably move on to, uh, the latest single, uh, that you guys have, which is, uh, Prestekvaya that you guys did with, is it Titor? Yeah, um, that was I would love to hear how that vision plays into the single, because I have to say, with everything we just talked about, that single was very different. Uh, dare I say trippy? Uh, it was quite the experience. <laughs> um, so my only familiarity with with Fairway's balladry um, is, is this the one that's associated with chain dancing? Yeah, cool. My only experience consistent experience with this is actually from the metal band Tear. Uh, in a lot of their albums, they have uh, they have this uh, they have a lot of kvayas on their albums. Um, so, would you like to tell us a little bit more, just like very briefly, about the actual ballad tradition, and then we can go into yeah. how your style influences the final product that is this incredibly I'm going to say it again trippy piece of music that that I just can't get enough of. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is uh, this is an old I think it's a it's a medie medieval. Uh, tradition uh you uh, just everyone holds hands and you just walk around in this step which is like two steps and one direction one step back mm -hmm. two steps in one direction one step back 
and there's typically a lead singer uh, that's that keeps track on every verse verse because there can be hundreds of verses right mm -hmm. and there's a sort of chorus which is typically just one line or two lines uh, of text that everyone sings along with right uh, so you get into this kind of trance where you just keep on doing this kind of quirky move which is and, and the tip and the melodies are often typically you know, they're quite quirky as well like if you talk about time signature or or yeah. at least like uh, bar structure uh so uh, and it's typically these really epic old uh, tunes like almost like icelandic sagas kind of yeah very much so so I, um... this particular song is about the two two or chieftains struggling for power and I think it's something like they're being attacked when they're out fishing with their sons and they're killed and their sons are taken cap captive and the sons they grew up and then they go to kill the other guys and it's like with this long kind of story. <laughs> yep, yeah. just just like how the sagas go and uh, and I know uh, you you mentioned when we were speaking earlier that this song could be a thousand years old. Um, and just you know, I'm taking liberties as both a musicologist and the guy who teaches Vikings yeah. to students. Uh, that absolutely would not be a stretch, right? Because the the uh, the format of the songs themselves, you know, those sagas would have been performed and and sung, and there are a lot of choruses in them. Uh, so it does bear a lot of striking resemblances to you know um, the saga tradition. Um, and now the dances themselves, the uh, is that where the percussion instrument in this single comes from? Because I couldn't help but hear the percussion as sort of like the stomping of the dance. Is that what you were going for? Uh, we were inspired by that, yes. Cool. But I think for the sound production for this whole track, it, it sort of went off the rails uh, <laughs> because uh, because I think it's I think it's an example of uh, when we want we want to do something we haven't done before, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of one of the creative premises of our band like if we yeah. get stuck in something we find a recipe and like oh this is really nice let's do this for 10 years you know yeah. that's, when our, that, that's when our band dies right uh, we have to keep moving so so this was the direction we went at now because we've been spending half a year on making music for a tv series uh, oh yeah in yeah, a cool. huge project, uh, which turned out to be too big, and the radio, the Danish radio uh, TV company, they shut it down because they oh really, no, they couldn't all that afford work. <laughs> all that work. Uh, yeah, that was it was the, their biggest production ever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so so yeah, all that work was lost. But we had still gotten all of this equipment for this production. I bought this hand simmer percussion pack. <laughs> <laughs> Hell <laughs> yeah. Having fun <laughs> with, with that. And uh, and we had made some recordings with this guy in, in Copenhagen. And uh, so I think uh, this recording is in part inspired by that process, like making these lots of samples, lots of big mm -hmm. sounds uh, and uh, soundscapes that kind of thing we've done that before but not like this uh so um mm -hmm. and of course the collaboration with Taito. you know it's our first recording with a singer you know yeah that that struck me because yeah. um you know like i it was one of those things like i read that you guys did it with Taito, but like it didn't register to me that there would be singing and it like still yeah. surprised me when the singing yeah. started uh yeah. <laughs> even though i should have known it was coming <laughs> yeah. also my first recording with a toggle harpa if you know that oh that is, yeah yeah that is so cool so that was a tal harpa yeah 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 cool I, awesome uh, yeah i i found some cool ways to play it uh in the intro it's like i'm like bending the tune the string mm -hmm. i don't know if you're supposed to do that but i think that's pretty <laughs> pretty clear to to also part of our philosophy like uh, our relationship to tradition isn't that it necessarily ha have to be uh, correct uh right because a hundred years ago, if someone got one of these toggle harpas and they didn't know how to play it, they would just try it anyway, right? Yeah, and then at that same <laughs> moment, <give> go. <laughs> at that same moment, one of those guys would have come along and be like, "Oh, can you write down? Can you play that melody so I can write it down? This is the way exactly. to play this instrument, exactly. right? And that's how these well, things can play out." We're, we're going with that. Uh... <laughs> cool. Yeah, and I just think like you know, to, to before you wrap up here, it's just like. What I love about this piece is like you've talked a whole lot about like cultural responsibility of you working with a tradition that is very old, but you're do also doing new and experimental things with it. 
And mm. especially now knowing that that's a tall harpa, I, orig I originally thought it was a clog fiddle that you were sort of like yeah. manipulating to sound like a tall harpa. Mm. And so you're using this really old dance tradition that if it's not a thousand years old, it's still medieval. And then you're using a tall harpa, which is absolutely a thousand year old instrument, if not more. Um, mm. But you're also using it with, you know, um, modern tech production or like sound yeah. sampling and all of that. I think it's just a, a very nice summary of what you all do at Dreamer's mm -hmm. Circus, like taking a thousand year old music, but making it sound perfectly at home today. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's what we want to do. Uh, I think uh, I think we love to um, be a part of the tradition and we, we view ourselves as being a part of the tradition. Uh, yeah, like I you don't, don't want to burn it down or anything. You just want to. You just want to. Oh, you want to fly a little bit. <laughs> I think what, what we're doing is is sort of just being musicians in in this century and this this time. Absolutely. I don't think any of these sort of legends from hundred or two hundred years ago would do any different, because right. you're all you. I think you have to do something that's relevant to you in your time. Absolutely. Uh, and as when you stop doing that, you kill the tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when it becomes a mu museum artifact, absolutely, rather than a living thing. Uh, so I don't. I'm not saying you have to mess it up and do something weird. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying you have to do something that feels relevant to you. Absolutely. And and sort of adding your person to their music. That's your responsibility. Yeah. And I also think if you have knowledge of the past uh, that you feel is worthy of passing on, mm -hmm. you have an, you almost have an obligation to do it. Absolutely. You know, if you feel this is good, this is good music. And, and in a way, I feel that what strikes me the most when I talk to people that have no idea about this music, you know, mm -hmm. what it means or anything. Imagine that you have a tune that you've learned uh, somehow, mm -hmm. and this tune has survived to this date because people throughout centuries have thought that this is a good tune. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And that in itself is like, wow <laughs> yeah i mean and, that's really and, something you know and when it stops being a good tune you don't pass it on so mm -hmm. it's you know it's fine <laughs> so i know uh but, knut hamra uh the the hard on your fiddler um he he has this philosophy called to be nothing which is when you you when you play a, a folk tune you're borrowing it like you become the folk tune you know this is only his philosophy you don't have to agree with that i find it fascinating where when you when you're playing a tradition um you sort of like filter yourself out of it. And for a moment you are borrowing this tune from the tradition and then someone else can hear it and then also decide to, to borrow it for a second, you know, in 10 years. And all of a sudden you've got like hundreds of years of people borrowing this tune for a second. Like a relay race. It, yeah, it's just like a relay race. And then I also love, uh, real quick, I love what you said about using the tradition in a way that feels true to you. Um, this week on the podcast, we just talked about Greek. Um, and huh. Edvard Grieg, and he's my favorite composer. I wrote my thesis on it for my master's. Um, oh, wow. And he had that same problem where he was not happy with the way Norwegians before him were treating folk music in a classical context. So he did something completely different, but people didn't appreciate that different thing he did until like 30 years later. Um, so yeah, because he was like, I got to do it in a way that that feels authentic to me. So you know, it's, it's a story as old as time for musicians, apparently. <laughs> and I think now, uh, you know, a couple of what is it, 40, 50 years ago in this folk revival movement, people were starting this experimentational phase, you know, and they made lots of, of resistance and a conflict with the conservative uh, establishment at the time. Uh, but they pulled through and uh, people started liking it more and more. And today, a person like me who listen who grew up listening to these pioneers mm -hmm. uh, i am enjoying the luxury of just being able and being allowed to uh, I, I don't i don't hear too much criticism you know it's not right. like someone is telling me to uh <laughs> you know stop 
meddling with the music, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm allowed to do it. Um, in Absolutely. part, perhaps, because I, 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 I know what the tradition is. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up with it. So if you can talk about cultural appropriation and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I know what it's supposed to be. I, I I grew up with it, and I feel confident and and safe in doing whatever I want with this music because you're a part of it. So you know that you have some. You know, this is gonna be a loaded word, but you know you have some authority on it. You're just like, I'm a part of this. So like, if I do something with it, it's it's my music just as much as it is yours. You can say it to anyone who's more on the conservative side of of the tradition. In a sense, and the funny thing is also there are so many different layers of this, right? You, you mentioned gamble dance, you oh, know? yeah, <laughs> and 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 gamble dance is is uh, is is a funny thing because it's primarily play, played by older people today, mm -hmm. but it's it's a modern thing, like it's only hundred years old. Yeah, absolutely. That, that movement and these choreographed dances and stuff. Uh, it's it's a, it's a new thing, and they're like a separate kind of subgroup <laughs> to the wilder, more living part of of folk music. And you know, it's and it becomes so messy nowadays that it's not easy to put people into groups. And and in a way, I think it's better now because you can just. I, I was about to it. say. Yeah. Yep. It, it, it there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, Yes, is like I feel like that that tension between innovation and preservation is a very healthy one. Mm. Um, you know, you sort of need the staunch traditionalists, uh, and you also need the dreamers, right? Yeah. That yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know, in the end, you know, time will tell. That the the I feel like what's a healthy mix of the two, is what sort of is the most likely to to be passed on. Um, okay. The history has a way of showing you that. The stuff carries on, the stuff filters out, you know, the present day is chaos, but people yeah. in the 50 years will look back yeah. and they'll be able to draw a line. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, and we love every single part of that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we, we love traditional music and we still play it. And we still just recently, we played a concert exclusively traditional tunes. <laughs> oh, that is <laughs> so cool. We, yeah, which we almost never do, <laughs> but uh, or which we actually, I think it's the first time we do it. Uh, and That's still uh, experimenting in a way. Yeah, If it it's your first us, time doing that, yeah. <laughs> for us it is. I mean, I've done it, but the band hasn't together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's part of our journey. And, uh, and we, we love traveling around uh, the world and sharing Danish music. And we're super exotic uh, in when we're playing in the US or when we play in uh, Japan yep. and you know it's like what is this where is what is Denmark you know and we go like <laughs> Lego uh H.C. Anderson they might know yep. that's that and, happiest place on earth right yeah exactly you know? <laughs> and, and, and we also have a local culture and local tradition and mm -hmm. you know and and it, it's sometimes interesting enough it can be as exotic in in, in Japan as in Denmark honestly because so many yep. people here they don't know about uh, uh the local history and and uh, we try to change that a bit by just spreading awareness and uh, and perhaps packing it you know <laughs> packaging it in a more accessible way sometimes mm -hmm. and uh, we do our best to pass them on to the the traditional uh places and uh gatherings and uh, hell yeah um i if i had another hour to talk to you i would absolutely <laughs> talk more about that whole being a cult being a bearer of nordic identity to you know the world because that you know from talking about greek from greek to abba to you guys yeah. like it scandinavia has always been in this this weird position where they're a part of the west but they're on the periphery of the west so they're mm -hmm. like they're both other and not and so when it comes to like cultural representation that's quite a job to have to be the one that's like bearing nordic identity to like international audiences um that's a whole can of worms that i would love to get into in the future because <laughs> uh this must be pretty daunting yeah it's a it's a big thing and and you know what we uh just to to, to finish off i think mm -hmm. what we normally say when we explain what we're doing and how we're doing it i think if you compare to other nordic brands 
say, for example, Nordic uh, design, mm -hmm. Nordic fashion, architecture, uh, Nordic gastronomy is, a, oh, is yeah. a very clear thing because all of these things are super fashionable and global global phenomena. Nordic uh, noir, for God's sake, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and I think. Uh, what shines through in these things is, is things like minimalism, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, for, for Danish music. And I think Nordic music in general, it's one of the key parts is strong melodies. Uh, Absolutely. That uh, sort of shine through strong themes. Um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and when we, if you talk about Dreamer Circus music, um, I think we like to, if you know Noma, for example, have you heard about that? It's a restaurant in Copenhagen. Oh, um, my wife yeah. is a my wife is a baker. I've got all of her cookbooks. Yeah, yeah. Me, uh, and oh. she she loved uh, that episode. He had an episode on Master Chef or something like that. Um, Probably, and she loved yeah. that and everything. Yeah, Noma. Noma yeah. is a three star Michelin restaurant, mm -hmm. right? In, uh, the best restaurant in the world. Uh, and what they do, what they were did in the beginning, at least, uh, you take these local ingredients. Mm -hmm. and you process them in completely new ways and you yeah. make something that you didn't know was possible to do with these local ingredients you know mm -hmm. and i think in a way that's sort of what we try to do with our music you pick out these local sort of things it can be things like a a dance it can be like a tonality it can be uh sort of kind of a groove uh, it can be lots lots of things right uh, that you take and then you sort of build something new on that take a right uh, tune in a sonata form or bring it up into a symphonic context or mm -hmm. or whatever um, and uh, and you've done something you created something new using these local traditions local ingredients so i think that's a really good parallel you draw you're like the noma of music you guys have like that you guys have like that <laughs> okay i like that one <laughs> yeah you guys have like that basement of like fermenting elk eye or something yeah, yeah, exactly, like that and he's exactly. like i'm going to turn this into a muffin uh, or something like that <laughs> exactly. so <laughs> all right well you know this is super awesome uh lost swans is going to be out april 8th correct Yes. Um, and I just want to say, while I have you here, I just, I just wanted to say very, very quickly, um, your last moon sessions that you guys did, um, those came out a few weeks after my, my closest uncle passed away. Um, oh. and so I just want you guys to know that, um, on a personal level, your music that helped me through that. Oh. Um, I even learned one of the melodies I can't remember on, I play mandolin too, a little bit. Um, and I, and I played it for him and I dedicated it to him and all that. Oh, so. God. <laughs> I just want you to know that your music, your music, uh, you know, it, it helps people, man. It, it touches people. So wow. every oh, time awesome. I watch that moan session, I just think of, you know, that weird time when like everything, everything was all right. And your, your music was there and it, you know, it made everything all right. So wow. I just wanted to make sure I told you guys that. So well, thank you, man. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right, cool. So, uh, where can people find you if they want to know more about you? Our website dreamercircus.com or or social media we'll try to keep it updated <laughs> cool awesome well ala thank you so much and uh it's really cool you are the very first interview on this channel um so yeah. you now have that that accolade i'll send you a, i'll send you a trophy or something uh <laughs> we'll be back to the states in in uh, september october oh cool Sorry. you're gonna be around colorado uh, um, that's a pretty short tour. I don't think so. We're gonna be close at that time. Iowa, Vermont, New York, Washington, perhaps something more. I'm not really sure. It's uh, all good. But... Uh, I'll I'll be waiting for you at your first Colorado concert. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. all right, cool. Ala, thank you so much. It was great to meet you, and I look forward to maybe uh, talking a little bit more in the future. Okay. Take care, man. Cool. Yeah. You too. Bye. See you. Bye. Hey.